and is the author of Voices of Marielle, Oral Histories of the 1980 Cuban Boat Lift. Victor Andres Trae is Professor of History at Middlesex College in Middletown, Connecticut, and is the author uh, of several books, including his first book, Operation Pedro Pan, which was the first study of that incredibly significant event. And he actually spoke uh, on that 20 years ago here. I was, I was just thinking about that. Uh, he and I were together. He also wrote, of course, Bay of Pigs, an oral history of the Brigade of, uh, of 2500, and the his latest book, The Mariel Bublik, A Cuban American Odyssey. What we're going to do is hear from both authors tonight, and I want to start with uh, Dr. Trier, who's going to give us a little bit of the context uh, of, the, uh, of the event and, and, and the history of, of that event uh, to set things up for Dr. Garcia. countries, and then Castro was doing this, you know, kind of effort um, and to, to split the exile community, uh, to bring over people who were, might have been sympathetic to uh, relations, and he was looking to make money. He was looking to make money. And two of the things that, that were discussed were the release of political prisoners, right, some who had been held since 1960 for doing, you know, awful, horrible things to the revolution, like speaking their mind or being against communism. Uh, which you got a 30-year sentence for in Cuba, um, and about the exiles visiting, right, to, to open up Cuba. Now, you have to understand, you know, once you left Cuba in the first couple of waves, you weren't allowed back. That's it. You were a non-existent person. Your families in Cuba were encouraged not ever to speak to you again, right? They could be in trouble. And the government's propaganda, the Cuban government had complete total control over all communication. Right, and, the whole, and, and of course they would tell the Cuban people that all the Cubans who had left were living in poverty and they were on the margins of society and in, in the United States, which of course the complete opposite was true. The Cuban economic miracle uh, was happening uh, during those same years. But Castro felt confident enough to allow these visits so that these people would leave money in Cuba. 1979, things, he opened the doors, more than 100,000 exiles went to Cuba, right? And it was electric. It was a shock. 
These people in Cuba who had been hearing that everyone that had left Cuba was living in poverty, these people are coming, pictures of their homes, right, of, 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 you know, of their vacations, of grocery shelves, and of the absolute freedom that they live with, elections, freedom of speech, being able to choose your own career, you know, and it wasn't just their families that were being shot, right? The whole neighborhood would come. The whole building would come, right? These people had never seen anything from the outside. Cuba, before that point, was almost like North Korea, right? You didn't know that the rest of the world even existed, only what they told you. And it just so happened, and of course, these exiles were going, of course, they were fleeced. They were forced to buy these travel packages that included things they would never use. They weren't allowed to take their relatives certain appliances. You had to buy them in Cuba at like two, three times the price from the government. They were buying them. And people were absolutely in shock that same year, after already 18 years of, of economic disaster, in spite of a little blip in 1978, the economy crashed again, simultaneous to these visits. And this caused a great desire to leave. A lot of families who had gone to visit were already talking, listen, there might be another opening, because that's how people in Cuba live. When's the next opening coming? When are we going to be able to leave? And a lot of families talked and said, if there's an opening, we're coming to get you. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. 1979-1980, the economy crashes, there's a blight on the, on the, on the uh, tobacco crop, the price of sugar drops, right, and there's frustration, there are uprisings, there's sabotage, and all of a sudden people start stealing boats, and the Cuba, you're not allowed to go on a boat, right, because then you'll, you'll leave, right? People started hijacking boats, and all of a sudden refugees started showing up in the uh, U.S., the Cuban government was getting angry uh, at the U.S., demanding that, that, that the U.S. government give these people immigrant visas, which, of course, at that moment, right, you know, things had, had taken a turn for the worse internationally. The hostage crisis, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, right, all the good feelings, you know, that weren't going to last anyway, uh, already, you know, were already, you know, disappearing. Um, and then something strange started happening. You know, just this desperation, the Cuban government had to really crack down, right, at the workplaces, at the schools. Uh, they, they, they passed the law of dangerousness. You can be a, a, arrested on the law of dangerousness. In other words, they considered it high probability that you were going to commit a crime. So they were arresting you before you committed it, giving you prison sentence, right? All right, communism at work. Right? And, but it got that bad. And then something strange that happened in Latin America, not strange, but unusual that happened in Latin American countries. If you feel that you are being pursued politically, you can take asylum in one another's embassies. Right? So you already had Cubans making a dash for foreign embassies in Havana. It wasn't always easy because there were guards and there was all this other stuff. The, the, the Venezuelan and Peruvian embassies, just because of their layout, was a little bit easier. Right, and so you had some Cubans who drove a car right through the gate of the Peruvian embassy. <laughs> they were given asylum. They put up the Cuban government, put up boulders at the entrance, doubled the guard, everything else. A few weeks later, another group had come in here to Boston, one who drove for a living, and a small group of people drove through right through one of the gates of the uh, embassy of Peru. Right, the bus went through far enough so that they were on embassy ground. The guy in charge, who was not the uh, ambassador, came out, gave them asylum. Castro was furious, absolutely furious, because when they crashed through, some of the guards, some of the Cuban guards started shooting at them, and one guard shot another accidentally, and he died. Right, and so Castro was furious. He was going to show the Peruvians a lesson, and he's going to show all the other Latin Americans a lesson about giving asylum to Cubans. And so he announced that he was removing the guard from the Peruvian embassy, all over the news in Cuba. In other words. If you want to go on the Peruvian embassy, go. Castro figured 50, 100 people are going to go in there. They're not going to be able to feed them. They're going to learn their lesson. In less than three days, more than 10,800 people were on the embassy grounds, about the size of a football field. No bathrooms, no food, no water. The Cuban government wasn't supplying them. Castro was embarrassed. He surrounded the embassy. The, the, the government denounced the people in the embassy that they were all delinquents, that they were perverts, that they were drug users, right? All this smear campaign against them, right? But they wouldn't leave and they wouldn't get out. The Castro had a problem on his hands, a big problem on his hands. I remember in Miami, I was 13 years old, and I remember all the rallies in Miami to stand with the Havana 10,000. Of course, I had no idea what was going on. I was 13 years of age, but I, I remember the spirit of all this. Then he didn't know what to do. 
And so international conferences started being held. They gave the people in the embassy safe conduct pass on the promise that they would be able to emigrate. Of course, Peru couldn't do it. Peru is a very poor country, right? And so they came up with a scheme to take the 10,000 Peruvian embassy uh, asylees to Peru. And then the Cuban government said, that's not going to work. Peru's too far. We want somewhere closer. In other words, they want to send to the United States. Costa Rica stepped up and said, we'll take them, and then we'll repatriate them elsewhere. People started going to Costa Rica. The Cubans would get there. They would kiss the ground. They would show the, the wounds that they had, the dog fights that they had from Cuba. Bad PR for Cuba. He shut that down. Now they got a problem. In the meantime, a group of the committee that had gone to negotiate with Castro from Miami before, people were very unpopular in Miami, he came up with an idea. And the idea was, let's make an announcement. He, 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 he proposed it to Castro. Tell the people in Miami to come to a port in Cuba and pick up those 10,000 asylees and take them to the United States. If, and they'll do it, but if and only if you let them take relatives with them. Okay, so you come, you take, you know, 20 uh, Peruvian embassy people, and you can take your, your cousin and your aunt, your uncle and, you know, who, you know, whoever else you're divided from. And it was approved. And the people went on the radio in Miami, said, go to Marielle, pick up, you know, your, your relatives and all. The U.S. government wasn't even paying attention to that. They had no idea this was going on, right? So the immigration policy is being set uh, independently. Um, boats started to go over. Boats started to bring people back. Right? The uh, you know, Border Patrol people in Key West, you know, with very Florida Keys, oh yeah, whatever, just about that paper, you know, and well, there's quite a few showing up today, aren't there? <laughs> well, there sure are. Well, are, you know what? Let's put out a warning. That'll stop it. Uh, just remember, it's illegal to bring people into the United States. That'll do it. Uh, and then, but the problem was that in Washington at this time, their, their minds were elsewhere. The, 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 the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan was going on. Okay, the, 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 the Tehran um, um, hostage crisis was going on, and right when the first boats were arriving in Marielle is when President Carter launched his disastrous rescue mission. You remember that? In the desert, and it was a fiasco. They weren't paying attention at all to what was happening on the southern border, right? Finally, a little while later, a meeting is held about what's going on. Walter Mondale, the vice president, um, was in charge of it, and there was really nothing they could do. It was illegal to stop boats from leaving port. And of course, when the boats were bringing people back, what are you going to do? You couldn't send them back because people wouldn't take them. You couldn't shoot them out of the water. All you could do was bring them to Key West so they could be processed. Right? And hence began the boat. The U.S. government continued to come out and said, this is illegal. You can't be doing this. And then President Carter on May 5th, someone asked him after, after a, a, a speech he gave what, what he thought about what was happening. And he said that, you know, we'll continue to receive refugees with open arms. That was a signal, and of course the White House freaked out because it's like, no, that's not our policy, and you call them refugees, right? If you name these people refugees, that had massive legal implications, right? That's a legal category, right? And of course, you know, they, they, they tried to stop it. President Carter then uh, issued a plan, like in, 19, in 1965, there was a bolt that lasted a few weeks, they replaced it with the organized freedom flights. President Carter proposed the same thing, a very rational plan that would allow not just these people in, from the embassy to come, but people's families. They set up centers in Miami. It was all very good. Castro rejected it. And he said, I'm unleashing this you know, on the United States. Of course, in Cuba itself, you know, the announcement went out, you know, whoever wants to leave Cuba can leave, which wasn't really true, but that was the announcement. Right? And then began the long odyssey in Cuba, right? Families being told that their relatives are going to marry out. These families in Cuba having to go to uh, an immigration office, right, to fill out the paperwork. But what the Castro regime did, they figured not everybody's going to leave. We need to radicalize those who are going to stay. And mobs were organized from one end of the country to the other to attack those families that were leaving, to attack them physically, to insult them, to humiliate them, to throw eggs and rocks at their homes, to attack them, to humiliate them, to beat them, right? The refugees were then, you know, you were taken first to what used to be a social club in Havana, right? Which was renamed the uh, Abreu Fontan. It used to be the, uh, a country club, 
right, where they were basically concentrated when you walked through the doors. You know, after the, however you transport, you were transported there. There was a line of people outside, like a gauntlet, ready to hit you, throw, throw rocks at you. It was all organized, right? They were then taken to a concentration center on the coast, barbed wire, attack dogs, the whole thing. What the refugees had to live through was horrific. And then the Cuban government wouldn't necessarily put you on the boat that came for you. Some people did, many people didn't. Many of the people who went to the port were people who didn't have families that came to pick them up, right? They're simply people who wanted to leave. Castro also identified antisocials. Whoever was considered an antisocial, right, was allowed to leave and encouraged to leave. So you had a lot more people than just the Peruvian embassy asylees and people's families. Most of them were good people, right? I mean, yes, prisoners were also sent, political prisoners, common prisoners were sent. But keep in mind, a lot of common prisoners in Cuba were people who were, you know, buying food on the black market so their family could eat, right? The, the number of real hardcore delinquent problem people was actually very small, right? But the press is going to make a huge deal out of them, right? Um, and then they would put you on the boats, maybe your families, maybe not. And the Cuban government would deliberately overload the boats. How many does that boat hold? 20. Put 50 on there. Right? And these are the government authorities telling you to do this. Why? So that it would sink. Right? My wife's boat sank. My wife was pulled out of the water by the U.S. Coast Guard. Thank you, Coast Guard. Right? Uh, and, and her parents weren't allowed to leave. She had to come without her parents. Right? Thank, you know, thankfully, she had some very good relatives in the United States who took care of her. Right, but what they put people through, but again, when you step back and you look at this and you say, my goodness, okay. So, first of all, you need your government's permission to emigrate, right? Emigration is, is considered a human right. As long as there's a country that will take you, right? I mean, you know, you know, countries don't have to take you, right? But your own government can't stop you from emigrating if you have the opportunity. All right, we'll, we'll get past that. All right, we'll just put that aside. But the government comes out and says, you can emigrate. But in the meantime, from the time we find out you're going to leave until the time you're on that ocean, we're going to make your life hell. We're going to starve you. We're going to beat you. We're going to humiliate you, whether you're 80 years old, whether you're 10 years old, whether you're with a family. We're going to throw potatoes at you with razor blades in them. OK, we're going to do all sorts of cruelties to you. It's just astounding you know, what, what these people did. Right? The refugees got to the United States. Those who had families were very lucky. Right, if they, if they connected with those families right away. Others, um, one of the big problems that, that President Carter had is that he couldn't name the, 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 the Mario refugees refugees because there were other refugee groups and he would have had to name them refugees and entitle them to all the refugee programs, which he didn't want to do. So he called them asylees. And they couldn't use any of the refugee programs. And President Carter had to give care of the refugees to FEMA. Right, the people who come in after hurricanes and ice storms. And of course, that, that ended up being uh, a big disaster. But I think one of the saddest things that happened uh, to the Mario refugees is that because they were delinquents, and Castro deliberately sent some hardened criminals, some people who you know, were you know, antisocial by the Cuban definition, did not adapt to the United States, knowing that they weren't, right, to, you know, to just enough just enough for the press, because they alerted the press in the United States, hey, we're sending over a bunch of delinquents, look for them, and they make sure they found them. And then the whole idea was that all 125,000 Mario refugees were all delinquents, they were all problem people, when in fact, you know, 97% of them made a very successful transition to the United States, became responsible, you know, good tax-paying citizens, very patriotic, but the media, the press, Hollywood, the movie Scarface, you remember, right, gives this impression that to this day you say marry out. And, you know, it's a prejudice. I found myself, when I introduced my wife, telling people very early that she came on the Mario Boatlift so they don't say the wrong thing, right, because she's faced that, 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 that prejudice her whole life, which I always thought was, you know, absurd. Uh, but, but it is what it is. And unfortunately, they, they, they had to live. Uh, with that stigma, but the vast majority of them made a very, very successful transition, uh, as, as well as any immigrant group um, ever has. And, and I had, you know, the, the good fortune to speak to many of them and to interview many of them, uh, including people who were lawyers and professors, Jose and Michael, uh, business owners, uh, the whole thing. And, and so, one of my primary motives was, to, to whatever degree you could do 
in a book published by an academic press. To add to the, the effort to say, these weren't bad people, right? Marielle's not a bad word, right? These people were just like any other immigrant group. It's incredible what the press can do and, 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 and the stigma that, that the press can cause. And unfortunately, these people were victimized by the Castro regime. The Castro regime first created that stigma, promoted that stigma, and it was just swallowed whole by the media of the United States and created that impression. But in spite of that, they fought on, they became very, very, very successful, uh, and all the ones I've ever met are you know, wonderful people. And you know, I wrote my book in large part to, to demonstrate that and to tell the story of Marriott. So that was my 15 minutes up. I want to take a minute, uh, I'm Dr. Garcia, and I want to take a minute to recognize my colleague, Mike Denner. Uh, he was the one that really pushed me to get the book published with the University of Press of Florida, so I think I owe him a lot for doing that, uh, because of what has happened with the book after that. One of the, I was going to start telling you a little bit about my project, how the whole thing began, and I'll do that. But uh, hearing, listening to Victor, he said something that was really interesting. And that is, I want to give you a sense of what Cuba, being a Mario Bo left, uh, left refugee, I want to give you a sense of what Cuba was like in 1979, 1980. In 1979, you'd be surprised, uh, Cuba was an incredibly uh, isolated country. I remember growing up as a 13-year-old, going to the central uh, part of my town, and anybody that came from any other place around the world, uh, and sometimes even from Cuba, was almost like uh, an alien had shown up. That's how isolated the country was from, from the outside world. Something happened, though, in 1979 that really changed everything. Uh, before 1979, when these Cubans began arriving, uh, the family, the relatives of the Cubans that had left in the 1960s and 70s began arriving. Again, Cuba was completely isolated. Most Cubans only believed what the uh, communist propaganda told them. What is happening in the Soviet Union right now in the Soviet Union? It doesn't exist anymore. In Russia right now, it was, has been going on in Cuba for 60 years. So uh, the only access to the outside world was what the communist propaganda gave, gave the Cubans. And, uh, in, in a way, you know, as a kid, I, I could honestly say that I was probably a little bit uh, indoctrinated into that. Uh, my background, though, made it a little different, though, in the sense that my grandparents all left Cuba in 1967, uh, and uh, my, well, my, on my side, uh, my mother's side of the family, they left in 1967, they came to, to the States, to the United States, and my other uh, grandparents were Spanish immigrants, and they went back to Spain in 1970. So I did have a little bit of access to the outside world, but I still, I bought into that propaganda thinking, you know, those are the enemies, you know. I remember growing up since I started learning about history when I was a kid, uh, first studying about the U.S. and thinking, man, uh, my grandparents live in the enemy country, you know, an empire, you know, that's horrible, you know. And then the history changes a little bit, and we're talking about Spain, and also my grandparents that immigrated from Spain, the people that came to Cuba and destroyed, you know, our country and this and that. So I, was, I always felt like I was on the wrong side of the fence. Uh, ironically, though, in 1980, my grandparents decided to go, go back to Cuba. Uh, and uh, I noticed right away a change. You would ask some of my friends, uh, what countries would we like to visit? And something that you would have never heard before was the fact that they wanted to visit the United States. Uh, you couldn't have said that in 1978, 79, because they would have called you a traitor. You know, what is wrong with you? Why would you want to go? So they, why would you want to visit, you know, that empire, evil country, you know? Uh, that, so that completely changed in 1980. Uh, and to my surprise, uh, I thought, well, when my grandparents come to visit, uh, they're going to be, people are not going to be happy to see them. Uh, the complete opposite uh, happened. I mean, people were, they were, especially my grandfather that had been a businessman, he was very welcomed by a lot of the people that he had uh, a relationship, business relationship with before before Castro, and, and to my surprise, I realized you know that there was something something that was uh, a lot of the things that they were saying about the, the people from the outside was was a big lie. Well, anyway, to to get into the project, my project uh, in 19 not 19 in 2009, I was given a sabbatical here at Florida Southern, 
and uh, I presented, uh, you know, my my uh, my project because I wanted to do something on the Mario voltage. At that time, in 2009, uh, considering the magnitude, right, of the Mario voltage, how many people left the country, right, in 1980. Uh, it's, it's actually the biggest seaborne exodus in Latin America's history. Considering the magnitude of the, uh, of the exodus, the, the information out there is very limited, or, or was very limited. Now we have more people such as Victor and other colleagues that are getting the word out on the Mario Bullet more. But it, it is not just American history, but it's also uh, not just Cuban history, but it's also history of Florida in a way, you know, because he was the biggest exodus in, in seaborne, in modern seaborne history. Uh, coming from Latin America, and also the fact that most of the refugees actually stay in Florida, and they have children and grandchildren children now that are descendants of, of the people that came in the, in the village. So anyway, so I thought, you know, uh, considering the, the fact that it's not a very well-known event, historical event, I think this is something that I could probably make a contribution to. The other reason why I wanted to, to uh, write about the, the, the Mario Bullet, uh, write an oral history about the Mario Bullet, was simply due to the fact of, uh, of the stigma that was actually placed on most of the refugees who came. Believe it or not, as a young uh, Cuban uh, Maria Olive refugee arriving in the United States, uh, I remember people asking me, and it is possible, were you in prison when you were in Cuba? Uh, how, how did you get here? And the stigma uh, was not only the rejection that we suffered, was not only from, from uh, what we suffered in Cuba with the acts of repudiation when, when we were living that we were attacked, because of the Cuban, uh, the government propaganda, but also uh, the rejection that we suffer uh, when we arrived in the United States by the American media, media and also even for Cuban Americans in Miami. There were many cases of, of Cubans that had arrived in the U.S. many years before that met up with the families that they had left behind, and within a few weeks they were actually thrown out of their houses uh, because they had basically grown so differently, you know, and, and a lot of those people have bought into that stigma. Uh, which have really affected the, the Mario Bullet refugees. I do want to recognize the fact that some of the people that came in the Mario Bullet were hardened criminals that committed some horrible crimes that uh, average American citizens paid for. That there was no need for that because of what Castro did when he decided to when he decided to uh, clean Cuba of all prisoners and, and anybody that he thought was was undesirable. Okay, so I started to, the project. Uh, I started writing my uh, book in Spanish, and then uh, I was in the middle of writing the book and something really interesting happened, and that is, it's funny how uh, life evolves. I was in a class here at Florida Southern, and I mentioned to, I came back from my sabbatical and I mentioned it to, to one of my students that I was in the process of uh, writing a book on, on Cuba, and he asked me when was the last time you were to, went to Cuba, and I said, well, it's been approximately 29 years, almost 30 years that I've been to Cuba, but I said I would love to go back and actually be able to get both sides of the story. You know, the, the, the story of the people that were left there and the people that that uh, that have already been interviewing here in order for my oral history. So uh, we decided we uh, he went to uh, I don't know if you guys are uh, familiar with him. Focus Communications here in Lakeland. He went to talk to him. Focus. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, long story short, they jumped on the on the project right away and decided that this was a great uh, thing that they wanted to do. They wanted to go back to Cuba uh, and do this with me. Uh, we decided, we started talking about how we were going to do this, and we approached some experts in Cuba and we said, "Well, can we ask the Cuban government for permission? Because we're going to tell the history of the Mario Bullet." And right away they said, "That's a horrible idea. That's a bad idea." The Cuban government, as soon as you tell them. That you're going to do that is not in their best interest, you know, to have uh, basically 125,000 citizens, right? That's bigger than Lakeland, if you think about it. Leave, pick up, and leave the country. So that's not something that they. In fact, they opened a museum shortly after the uh, the Mario Bullet in Cuba, and they closed it within a few months because they thought we don't want, even want to talk about this particular incident. And anyway, so I decided to to we decided we're going to do the project, but we're not going to get uh, we're not going to tell the Cuba government. So how do we do that? Well, we can go, at the time it was a lot more difficult to go back to Cuba, so we decided we're gonna go to Mexico. So we were gonna go to Mexico, the Mexicans had everything set up. We decided we were gonna have an excuse uh, to go to Cuba, and that was that we were going on a fishing trip. 
because supposedly I had told them that uh, there was really good fishing here in my hometown uh, in central Cuba, so we were going to do that. So we made the reservations and everything to Canada, okay, uh, to go back to Cuba. So uh, as you can imagine, to me showing up in Cuba uh, 30 years later uh, was probably the most memorable experience of my life. I have been to other places around the world. I have visited many places in Europe and, and around the world. And, and I remember sitting on that airplane and looking outside the window, and you could tell that I have, I could tell that I had arrived in a place that was different. I mean, when you show up in other countries, the people that, that come to take your suitcases out of the airplane are not dressed in olive uniforms, right? Uh, it's in military fatigue, right? So, uh, but I remember sitting there and thinking, you know, what we're going to do, because we have hidden cameras and hidden microphones, what we're going to do is illegal. And in the Cuban Penal Code, if you get caught doing anything, if you happen to be a Cuban and you get caught doing anything that they could interpret as enemy propaganda, it's an automatic 10-year prison uh, for doing that. So, uh, as you can imagine, I was really scared. But one thing that I felt when I was in that plane is, you know, what I'm doing is the right thing. And if anything were to happen to me, uh, this is probably the best place where it could happen. Uh, and I'll be, you know, I'll be in my, home, in my, in my homeland, uh, which is probably sounds a little idealistic, but, but I, that's exactly what I felt. Uh, anyway, so we started traveling through the, through the country. Uh, and I'm going to go run down because we only have a limited amount of time. Uh, we arrived in Havana, and the repression, what I remember Cuba like being in the 1970s, was completely different from the very first day that I arrived there, uh, and I walked out of the hotel at night in central uh, in Havana. Uh, the guy that was actually guarding the hotel said to me, uh, dressed in a military uniform, says to me, so where are you from? And I said, well, I'm, I'm actually from, from here. And right away he gives me a hug and he said, welcome to your country. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. Uh, this would have never happened when I was, when I was in, living here in the 1970s. So I could tell that something had completely changed. But I still, uh, you know, I had to be careful because I knew how things worked in Cuba. So we needed a taxi driver to take us to, I want to do a rundown of the places that I had left before I left Cuba in the Mario Bullet. So we decided that we were going to uh, get a cab driver. We had to go, I'm not kidding, through approximately 10 taxi drivers until I found one that I felt really comfortable with. Because most of, many of the taxi drivers in Cuba, uh, guess what they do? They work for the Cuban government, or, or are somehow associated to the Cuban government. So I found the guy that I, and I told him, never openly did I say, I'm here because we're going to do a book and we're doing this project. I just said, I'm here because I want reminiscence on my Mario Bolet experience, and I want I want you to take us to some of those places, the places that, that you know that I visited in Cuba, uh, that I visited before, that I was in before we left. So we, uh, I found this guy. He took us first. He took us. There's a documentary, and you, some of the stuff that I'm mentioning here is in the documentary that, that came out in 2011. Uh, some of the places, uh, the first place that we visited, I found the guy out in the street and I said, you know, can you take us to the port? We were going to find where the Mario port was. And he says, yeah, I can take you to the, to the port. Uh, the port is actually, it's, from, it's in my house. The backyard, my backyard uh, leads to the, to the port. Uh, and I thought that was, that was great. So I said, well, let's go. Please take us there. So he took us over there. Uh, we, we, you know, we shot a little bit of the footage there. And then uh, we left that place, and then I wanted him to, uh, we also went to the mosquito camp. It's one of the camps that we left before we left the Victor mentioned where they had dogs and, and barbed wire and all that. And uh, this my particular man says uh, he wanted to, I asked him if he wanted a right to go back to Havana. And just to give you an idea how things work in Cuba, automatically the, uh, the taxi driver says, no, he cannot come with us. And I said, why, why can't he come with us? If this guy has been so nice that he has taken us to his house and showed us everything, why can't he come? He says, well, uh, he knows that he cannot come with us. And finally, the man looked at him and said, yeah, he, he's right. Uh, the reason why that was is because if they would have found a Cuban citizen with uh, tourists or foreigners in a car, they would have stopped the car and they would have searched the car. And Remember, the, cap, the, uh, the taxi driver, I never told him what I was doing because I knew I didn't want to get him in trouble. He could have said later if he got caught, you know, well, I was just doing what they told me to do. 
what they were asking me to do, you know, as a cab driver, I was doing what I do as a, for my job. So uh, then we got in the cab driver, and we got in the taxi, and we had to go all the way around into a different route into Havana. When I was doing this, I felt like I was in one of those Germany Nazi uh, movies that you see where they have stops everywhere in the highways, uh, because every few every, every few uh, you know uh, kilometers there was a there were there were policemen right stopping people, and I said why why are you going taking a different route? And he said well on the way here there was a very young policeman with a very young uniform, that and we made eye contact and I know he's going to stop me on the way back. So we're going to have to find a different route, just to give you an idea how things uh, work in Cuba. Uh, then after that, I went, I went back to my, my hometown. Uh, remember what, I, uh, what Victor said about the people that left, that they were considered criminals, that, they were, that the people would throw rocks at them? OK, just to give you an idea of how things work in Cuba, I ran into a cousin that I had, never, that I had not seen in, in what, 10 years, right? And one of my friends, uh, I really connected with my friends right away after so many years. But one of my friends took me to the park in the center part of, uh, part of the town. And he sees a, a woman walking by and he says, uh, would you like, uh, you know, do you know who that is? And I said, well, uh, no, not really. He's like, that's your cousin. So uh, he calls her. He comes. She comes to talk to me. She's standing in front of me. He's asking her, so do you know him? She asked him two or three times. And I finally said, you know, well, please tell her who I am. Uh, she tells, uh, he tells her who I am, what do you think her reaction would have been? Uh, and these are the only cousins that I have left from the Spanish side of the family in my hometown. Uh, what do you think her reaction would have been? To jump at me and hug me? She turned around and said, oh, okay, and took off almost like she was in, in uh, a roll skate, I mean, because of the fact that she did not want to see her, she didn't want anybody to see her. Uh, associated to somebody who left 30 years before. So that is just to give you an idea how, how people, you know what I mean, are mentally uh, brainwashed and, and penetrated and the fear that, that, that lives in, in people's lives, you know, that, that uh, that's how the country works. Okay, wait, anyway, so I did, we did the, uh, the documentary, we finished the documentary, we brought it back, and uh, we were lucky enough to, to win three awards in three different places. Uh, the first time we showed it in Tampa, we won uh, Best uh, Documentary Award. Then we showed it in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, we also won there, and we won in the uh, we won in the Gasparilla uh, Film Festival in Tampa. And then we also won an award in uh, in Aruba in uh, Best uh, Caribbean uh, Documentary, which was a real surprise for all of us. You know, the fact that we won those three awards because I, I would have never expected uh, we would have never expected that. Uh, then. Uh, Remember the book that I, was, I told you that I was writing in Spanish? Uh, what do you think happened during this documentary uh, uh, excursion, sort of speak? It went into the back burner. And I had to forget about it for a little bit because we were so focused on the, uh, on the documentary. So uh, shortly after that, I wrote the book in Spanish. And I published a book in Spanish in, in Miami. And then uh, after that, I decided to, to publish a book in, in English. So I wrote the book in English. Uh, with the help of my colleague here, he said, why don't you submit it to the University of Press of Florida? And I submitted it, and they uh, approved it. They, they really liked it. Uh, right after the, uh, the uh, documentary, the book came out in English in 2018. Uh, yours came out in 2019? Right, a year before. Uh, I received a call, uh, which is probably one of the biggest accomplishments that I think I have with the book which is from the uh, American Historical Association. Uh, they feature the book in one of their, their magazines. And that went to almost every university in the States. And in other places, I uh, was invited to go and speak in Australia and other places in, in Europe. So the book has done relatively, really, really well. Uh, and uh, I guess my, my goal for the uh, documentary and the book is to, to teach about the Mario Paul lift, you know, despite, uh, you know, it is incredible, again, that considering the magnitude of the, of the bullet and how many people left Cuba in 1980 and the impact that it probably had, and that it's going to have for years to come in Florida and in American society because of the many descendants, right, that are around, uh, it is surprising that most people don't even know about the Mario Bullet. And I'm sure some of you probably never heard of the Mario Bullet, which is a 
it's an important part, in my opinion, of, of uh, Florida industry. So uh, the book is now being used as, as a teaching tool, which is my goal, and with along with the uh, with the documentary. Uh, and and for the future, that's that's something that I want to be able to to continue doing to to uh, teach about the Mario Bullet, uh, teach people about the Mario Bullet, and also uh, sort of clean, so to speak, that image that was imposed on the uh, on the Marielitos. Uh, even today, when you tell other Cubans uh, that the Mario Bullet, that you came in Mario Bullet, uh, I can tell right away the reaction is in the back of their mind. They're like, well, that, those were not the so good, good Cubans, uh, which is interesting. Okay, so uh, if you guys have any questions uh, for us, right? Welcome questions, but we're kind of microphone light right now. So if you'd like to ask a question, why don't you kind of come up front and um, yell out the question to to or, or no, just uh, answer the question. And um, and I don't think that's It's not plugged in. There's only work. one. Input. So 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 just come on up here and ask a question, and then we'll, you guys will repeat it. Project. While people are moving up, how many of y'all have seen the, the Voices of Marielle video? It's been out for quite a while. It is one of the most compelling, compelling uh, programs that I've ever seen. Uh, where, it, where do you get it? Where do you see it? I think it is in available tonight. I think it, it is. It is absolutely. Um, it's absolutely amazing. Yes, sir. Brought back to rebels. CIA brought back to rebels that have gone down. The Bay of Pigs. The Bay of Pigs veterans? Yeah, I've, I've done a lot of research. I've been with the, with the Bay of Pigs veterans. In fact, that's what I've researched the most in my career. Do you know any of them? I know many, many, <laughs> many of them. I mean, many, including many that went to the University of Florida. Victor, tell about the, um, about the project. That you well, I, I, I wrote my first book about uh, the Brigade 2506 which was the invasion force of the Bay of Pigs that I had published in 2001. Um, and, then, uh, and then Random House published it in Spanish. Uh, and then I also wrote um, a historical fiction trilogy uh, centered mostly on the brigade. And then Florida International University hired me in 2016 and 17 uh, to do the biggest oral history ever on the Bay of Pigs invasion. I interviewed about 115 of the veterans but I grew up with a lot of these guys, right? I mean, they're all in my parents' generation, right? So I had friends whose fathers were in the brigade and relatives, so these guys were in my life um, for a long time. Um, and then I worked with the brigade very closely on other projects. I just consulted the American Museum of Cuban Diaspora on a beautiful Bay of Pigs exhibit that they have up right now. And so, yeah, I, 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 yes, I do know many. And, and, and you have a question? Well, I met one named Mark. Mario Martinez Milo? Yeah. Yes, yeah, he passed away last year. He did. Yes, he did. Yes, yeah, but I, 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 I did know him. In fact, um, I just saw something from his daughter on Facebook before I came here. So, yeah, I know him. I'm very close friends with his son in law. Uh, my father went to school with Mario in Cuba, and my aunt and my father both were, were both very good friends of his. And he's a big time gamer, and I know that. So, all right. All right. Any other questions? No other questions. I believe it. Oh, my goodness. Since one of you talked about what it was like, and particularly the use of the river, um, just give us a little synopsis synopsis of what it was like to be on the boat between Cuba and. Yeah. Well, if you if you want, if, I'm, I'm not, not going to answer for him, sure. but he is one of my interviewees, mm -hmm. and I use his story of his experience on the boat in my book. So I'm sure Mike, you know, I'm sure it's in the library here, right? I'm open to the library, Mike. Um, and, and, and so he actually told me that story. So that story. And, is and the book. story is actually on the third chapter of my uh, of my book. Uh, the whole, uh, but I can give you a synopsis uh, really quickly here. Uh, that's my, uh, you can hear me, right? Can everybody hear me? No. 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 I, I get very scared with my. For that. Watch your old uh, people. This, uh, okay, so uh, my uncle went to get 
to pick us up. We were not some of the people that went into the embassy because approximately, remember, almost 11,000 people went into the embassy. So as soon as my uh, grandmother heard, she would live in New York at the time, that the Mario Bull lift was going on, and that Fidel Castro said that if anybody came from the US to pick up the family, they could do that. They could, uh, my uncle decided, uh, this happened within a few hours. He was in New York uh, attending a customer. Uh, he was a salesperson for Goya Foods. And he borrowed $5,000 from the Goya, from the, his customer. What a nice customer that was, right? He said, here, take this money. He flew right away to Miami. From Miami, he uh, got connected with uh, another friend. And him and other Cubans rented a boat. So within uh, probably 48 to uh, three days, he was in, at the Fort of Mariel. To make a long story short, he waited almost a month, right, to, uh, to uh, be able to take us out, to pick us up. So the Cuban government started using this strategy. They wanted to, remember, they wanted to get rid of all of those people that they thought were uh, undesirable, including uh, prostitutes, uh, gay people, uh, people that did not, the, the Jehovah Witnesses were one of those who were really targeted. Uh, so what he did is he would make the people wait at the port, and then uh, after a while the people got tired and they said, well, we're going to leave now. They would say, well, you're going to have to load up the boat, uh, the, the boat with people that we put on your boat with the promise that we're going to send your family later. And sometimes that didn't happen, and in our case it did happen. Within a month after that, we were allowed to leave the country. Uh, I'm not going to get into the specific details, but it, to us it was particularly uh, a very uh, difficult trajectory because of the fact that my father had been in a relatively good position before all of this happened, and he was very scared to show that he was going to leave the country. Uh, so he had to uh, be fired, forcibly, he, this was all a plot, to get fired and then be able to get a new identity card saying that he was just a secretary even though he was a civil engineer to be able to, to come to the U.S. And we were very scared that he, he got caught. He could, uh, people that work for him have been accused of knowing military secrets. He could have ended up in prison. Again, and then in a flash, we uh, waited five days at the port. Uh, then we started sailing to the U.S. and the boat started sinking. And we finally got, we were lucky enough to be rescued and, and brought to Florida. So that is in a nutshell my synopsis of my, my trip from Cuba. But if you want to see more of the details there, there in the book. I hope I answered your question. I'm sorry, I actually found a picture of his friend when he was at the University of Florida. And somebody said, man, do I have it? So. All right. I, I want to make a quick comment, uh, really, really quick to wrap it up. You know everything that is happening in, in Russia right now with Ukraine? Yeah, you know, the more I see that, you know, and I feel for what's happening in Ukraine with those people, but what is happening in Ukraine in regards to the media, you know, the, Soviet, the, the Russian government has completely suppressed, right, all of free media. That has been going on for years, for 60 years in Cuba. Uh, Cuba, believe it or not, uh, it is surprising that they are still doing what they're doing after so many years. Uh, and there has been a silent war against the Cuban people for a long, long time. So when I see what's happening in Ukraine now, I feel, you know, like, what, what about us? We're 90 miles down the street. And this has been going on in, in, in Cuba for, for so many years. Uh, but anyway, I, I just thought I wanted to make that comment. I mean, a lot of the things that I hear, uh, and I have a Russian student that actually uh, is reading my book and said to me, I see Russia in a lot of your book. So I thought that was interesting. Wasn't that great? Thank you.